Canadian tax returns. Maximize your tax refund with these year-end tax tips. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Danish, and I make personal finance, investing, and real estate topics easy to keep up with and understand. As we approach the end of the year, I want to highlight seven strategies that I've personally used so that you can take advantage of and maximize your tax refund next year and minimize your 2020 tax liability. I will give you one other strategy, which is not necessarily tax related, but you should definitely take advantage of as year end approaches. A lot of people miss out on this one, so don't let it be you. First up, the TFSA, or the Tax-Free Savings Account. The 2020 annual limit for the TFSA is $6,000. If you have made no contributions at all, then the lifetime limit is $69,500 for those 18 and older since 2009. If you have room available in your TFSA, then you can potentially move your assets or any other holdings that may be in your non-registered account to the TFSA. The downside to implementing the strategy is that you need to be aware of capital gains tax when you sell your investments. On the upside, once you transfer your investments from the non-registered account to the TFSA, it will continue to grow tax-free. This also gives you an opportunity to tax loss harvest from your non-registered account and then move the funds to your TFSA. Tax loss harvesting is only available in non-registered accounts, meaning you cannot use this for your TFSA. I'm going to further highlight how tax loss harvesting works in an upcoming point. But what if you've already maxed out your TFSA and you have no contribution room left? The other thing you can do is that if you need the money from your TFSA, now would be the perfect time to take some money out. Because when you make withdrawals from your TFSA, it becomes new contribution room the next year. So that means if you take money out right now in December, that will turn into immediate contribution room Gen 1 of 2021. Withdrawals from your TFSA increase future contribution rooms based on the value of the withdrawal itself. If you want to learn more about the TFSA and the rules surrounding contribution, withdrawals, and what may be considered day trading in the TFSA, then I recommend you check out this video. It has everything you need to know on how to maximize your TFSA. The second strategy I'm going to talk about is known as tax loss selling or tax loss harvesting. This is a very popular year-end strategy as it allows you to maximize your refund if one is available and to cut back on your capital gains tax. The main advantage of using this strategy is that it allows you to take the tax benefit for selling an underperforming investment. For you to realize a loss on this investment, the market value must be lower than its adjusted cost base, also known as the ACB, at the time of selling this investment. For example, let's say you bought a stock that was worth $8,000, and today the market value is only $500. If you sell this asset, then you'll have a taxable loss of $500. The adjusted cost base, or the ACB, is just a fancy tax term. And it simply means that it's a value of what you paid for your investment, plus any charges, commissions, or any other costs associated with buying the security. To make sure you capture this loss in 2020, I recommend you sell your holdings a few days before December 31st, because sometimes it can take up to three days for a transaction to be posted. If this transaction is posted on Jan 1 of the following year, then you can no longer use this loss in 2020. Once you realize this taxable loss in 2020, then you can go ahead and offset any capital gains you may have in 2020. And if you don't have any capital gains in 2020, then you can take this loss and carry it back into the last three taxation years. But what if you don't even have any loss in the last three taxation years? Well, then you can go ahead and carry this loss indefinitely into the future until that point in time where you actually have capital gains to offset against. One warning I have that I want you to be aware of if you are using this strategy is something called a superficial loss. A superficial loss happens when you or an affiliated taxpayer such as your spouse buys an identical asset within 30 days of you selling the asset. If this happens, the CRA will deny your tax loss claim. For this strategy, I recommend you speak with your CPA or investment advisor to make sure this strategy makes sense for you. This strategy can be complicated, and I don't want you getting hit with unnecessary taxes or penalty due to poor execution. Strategy number three, deferring realization of capital gains. When we were looking at the tax loss harvesting strategy for it to work, you had to make sure you had your transactions set before December 31st. 
for this strategy, you want to make sure your transactions occur after Jan 1 of the new year. In this case, Jan 1 of 2021. Why is this timing so important? Well, if you sell an asset such as a stock, an ETF, or a mutual fund, and the market value is higher than what you paid for, then you may have capital gains tax, which means you'll only be taxed on 50% of the gain itself. If your asset is in a registered account like the TFSA, the RSP, or the RESP, then you don't have to worry about capital gains tax. This is only applicable for non-registered accounts, also sometimes known as marginal accounts. By waiting until Jan 1 of 2021 to sell your asset, you won't have to pay capital gains tax until your taxes are due on April 30th, 2022. By waiting a few days or a few weeks from December to Jan of 2021, you've bought yourself an extra year to pay your capital gains tax. With this extra year, you have more time to manage your cash flow in order to pay this tax. Or maybe you're in a lower tax bracket next year and your income isn't as high. This could happen under paternity leave or maternity leave. This will help lower your tax bill by deferring your capital gains to a year when your income is in a much lower tax bracket. There could be other factors in play which might impact your taxes, but this is just to give you a general concept of the strategy. By taking advantage of timing your investment dispositions, this gives you some tax planning opportunity. The fourth strategy is related to your RRSP. 2020 RRSP contributions can be made until March 1st of 2021. But you may want to consider contributing earlier to take better advantage of tax deferred growth. The sooner you invest in your RSP, the more time those investments have to grow on a tax deferred basis. If you work with a CPA, ask them if they can estimate your personal taxes for 2020 between now and March of next year. By doing so, you'll have an understanding whether you are in a tax refund position or a tax liability. Once you know that, you can estimate how much RSP you need to contribute if you still have room to either minimize that tax liability or to maximize your refund. This is another time-based tax planning strategy. If used correctly, this can positively impact your next tax bill. The fifth strategy is related to the RESP contribution. The lifetime contribution limit for the registered education savings plan is $50,000 per beneficiary. For every $2,500 you contribute to the plan annually, the government will give you a maximum annual grant of $500, making the total contribution to the plan $3,000. Contributions less than $2,500 will still get you a 20% grant from the government. Just like the RRSP, the investments within the RESP also grow on a tax deferred basis. On a side note, you have to invest the funds within the RESP to take full advantage of that tax deferred growth. Otherwise, the funds or that cash sitting there will just lose value to inflation. If you haven't made any contributions to the RESP so far in 2020, go ahead and take advantage while it's still December. Ideally, you want to contribute $2,500 so you can get that maximum $500 grant. And if you can't contribute $2,500, that's okay. Contribute whatever you can. So that way, you can still get a 20% grant on your contribution. The main purpose of the RESP is to fund your child's education costs in the future. You want this money to grow as much as possible on a tax deferred basis. The more time you give it to grow, the more funds will be available to your child to access in the future. The maximum lifetime grant available from the government is $7,200 and is available until your child turns 18. Strategy number six is around charitable donations. When you make a charitable donation in any tax year, you receive something called a donation tax credit. Be sure the organization you're giving the donation to is a qualified charity, otherwise you won't get that donation tax credit. You have until December 31st, 2020 to make a donation for that donation to be counted as a tax credit on your 2020 taxes. You will get a 15% tax credit on the first $200 worth of donations. Anything above this amount will get you a tax credit of 29%. Let's say in 2020, you donated $300. The first $200 will get you that 15% credit. That next $100 will then get you a 29% credit. In this case, your total federal tax credit will be $59. Based on the province you live in, you may get an additional donation tax credit from your provincial government as a provincial tax credit. Pro tip, donations can be pooled together for spouses. Meaning if both you and your spouse have made charitable donations throughout the year, it may be better 
to claim the donations together on one tax return instead of splitting the donations on one and the other tax return. Alternatively, you can also donate securities with an unrealized capital gains in kind to a registered charity versus donating cash. Donations of equities with unrealized capital gains can be very tax efficient as you are exempt from the capital gains tax and you also receive a tax credit for the full fair market value of your donation. If you have ever heard of the term donor advised funds, this is where the strategy leads, especially if you're looking to donate a large sum of securities. The seventh strategy is related to the timing of your investment purchases. If you are investing into a mutual fund or ETF late into the calendar year, especially around December in a non-registered account, you want to pay close attention to their distribution dates because distributions earned in a non-registered account are fully taxable. So make sure you pay attention to those various distribution dates. Certain ETFs or mutual funds have annual distribution dates versus quarterly and monthly distribution dates. If you are investing in one of these funds, you could potentially get hit with a year's worth of income distribution in December. This is no different than if you had invested earlier in the year like January and the income had been accruing since that period. This may not be a big deal based on how much you're investing, but definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. Do you want to pay tax on a full year's worth of income distribution, especially if you're investing in December? As promised, I have one last strategy for you. Again, not tax rated, but definitely something that you can take advantage of. This relates to your extended health benefits offered by your workplace. Do you have extended health benefits or a flexible spending account for healthcare offered by your work? Take a moment to check any remaining balances within your extended benefits and go make use of these benefits before the end of the year. You've already paid for these extended benefits through payroll deductions, so why let them go to waste? Maybe you need new glasses or want to treat yourself to a nice massage, or you can go see a registered dietitian or maybe even a chiropractor for any injury you may have. There is a whole host of benefits that goes wasted every year. It's not about taking advantage, it's about making sure you take care of yourself for benefits you've already paid for. Since these benefits reset on Gen 1 of the next calendar year, whatever unused balances you have will just go to waste. Some of the strategies I covered in this video can be complicated, so make sure to ask your CPA or your investment advisor or your tax accountant if these strategies make sense for you. Because the last thing you want is to get hit with unknown CRA penalties or maybe even an audit. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and leave your comments down below. Maybe there's a strategy that you're using that I haven't covered in this video. I'll catch you guys in the next one.